Welcome everyone, it is time for the Fall 2017 Anime Guide. I am Brent Newhall, Otaku No Video. Thank you all very much for joining me. Where We're going to go through 21 first episodes of anime that I've watched for this season. I'm going to give you my hot take on those shows. Before I begin, just should let you know... As with every anime series and every anime season I try to catch up on, there's always one or two shows that fall through the cracks or that come out just before the show airs or I record, whatever. So there's probably one show that you've seen that I haven't gotten a chance to put on this list. So apologies. I'm going to get to as many as I can. Also, I should point out, this is my take. You don't have to love every show I love or vice versa. That's totally fine. Um, also, I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can because I've got 21 anime to talk about here. So, let us start with kind of an odd one. Um, one that I did not have any familiar with, but I started checking out. Um, uh, I'm a Iro Coco series. This is called, I believe, uh, what was this? A Rainy Coco was is what it's called on Crunchyroll. By the way, CR down there means it's on Crunchyroll. Um, this is apparently part of an Otome game. Uh, in other words, a series aimed at girls with a lot of cute guys. It's a, I think, three or five minute episode um, about a hot guy who's moved to Hawaii and is writing um, messages back to his hot guy friends back in Japan. Um, this has a very, this is one of those fun, nice little uh, um, uh, episode segments. One of those things where nothing much happens, it's just about... Um, sort of introducing the concept, introducing the characters. I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun and nice. Um, I think it's definitely made for people who are more familiar with this franchise, though. Um, but no complaints. You know, all of the um, all of the elements all fit. You know, the animation was enough to get across the characters. The characters looked pretty. Um, nobody looked particularly off model or anything. I particularly appreciated the visuals of the different environments like Hawaii looked reasonably like Hawaii and not like Japan and vice versa so that was nice uh, pretty colorful as well a pretty, a pretty bright show uh, which makes sense for something like this so I enjoyed it um, you know I think it's one of those things that's worth checking out if that kind of concept sounds fun to you um, but that first episode is definitely just kind of here's the characters here's the concept and we'll see where it goes from there um, moving on to one of the um, uh, more significant anime of this season in terms of what folks are talking about, The Ancient Magus's Bride, also on Crunchyroll. This is um, based on a uh, pretty long-running manga. There are, I think, eight volumes out now, seven volumes out now in America. I have them all, uh, with an eighth one coming, and I think they're up to volume eight or nine in Japan. There was an OVA of this a uh, little while ago, and now we're getting a, a TV anime series. The animation budget in this is quite impressive. Obviously, for a first episode of anything, they tend to up the animation budget. But this concept, uh, which I'll get to in a second, needs a pretty significant animation budget, and it's definitely there in this episode. So, um, definitely like that. Also impressed with the detail of the character designs. Um, when manga comes to anime, they have to do a certain amount of simplifying of the character designs so that lots of different animators can animate them consistently. Um, but still, these felt very detailed. Uh, the basic concept is that this teenage Japanese girl basically sells herself to a, a mage. And uh, the mage accepts her as his um, apprentice, if you will. Although that's a, kind of a loaded term in this context. Uh, it's set in a... It's actually set in England. Um, in the English countryside. So there is sort of English magic involved, not Japanese magic, not kind of our American magic, but very much hedge magic in that classic sense. What I really like is that the show introduces these characters and this premise, does not explain a lot about the world and the situation, and leaves that for later. There's a lot of context behind what you see in this episode, which is explained later on in the story, um, or at least delve into in more detail, and they don't try to overload you with that in the first episode. I really appreciated that. that they're just like, this is what's happening. You get to 
make assumptions or try to figure out what's going on, um, and maybe we'll explain, maybe we won't, right? It, it's, there's a, a lot of mystery to this, and I really appreciate that they, they, they left that. Um, I also appreciate the fact that um, hedge magic in this is dangerous, and um, people who do magic are not necessarily good and nice, and you may come across things that are really, really dangerous, and you won't know. It's not, you know, here are good people and here are evil people. There are creatures that don't think the way people do. Uh, very faithful adaptation of the manga, which is not always the best thing, but, um, you know, that is certainly uh, true here, as far as we can see. Uh, lovely music as well, uh, sort of a Celtic style. Um, also interesting, in the manga, there is a... Uh, the characters will occasionally go into a quasi-super-deformed mode, uh, slightly super-deformed mode, and that is still here in the anime. A couple of times in the episode, when the characters are having kind of a comedic moment, they'll be briefly drawn in this style. Um, it's something that feels a little bit out of place um, when you first see it, but once you get used to it, it's a an effective way of changing up the tone. So that's certainly there, um, but it might be a little surprising when you first see it. Uh, all right, moving on to Anime Gataris, which is a ba about basically an anime club at a Japanese high school. Um, this is basically setting up the characters and setting up the situation. What's fun about it is that it is about anime fandom kind of from an outsider's perspective. The main character, I don't think it's a spoiler to say, the, the main character um, is aware of anime, watched anime as a kid, isn't a huge anime fan now, but comes across other anime fans and starts getting involved in this um, this anime club, or this potential anime club. So she's kind of experiencing it through other people. And that's a really interesting way of approaching it. The animation in this is, I mean, it's more of a school life show, so there's not a lot of ridiculous over-the-top animation, but when they're showing like a clip from a super robot show, that is definitely in the classic Super Robot style. So they do a, a good job of matching the animation quality to the, the show and the episode, uh, and not, you know, throwing lots of animation behind just the little moments in this kind of show. It's not that kind of a show. Um, one of the fun things, too, in this were the side moments. So a lot of the lines by side characters, you just hear people saying, you know, um, on the side are actually quite funny. Um, so someone's obviously paying attention to those little bits of dialogue around. It's a sign of good quality. Um, it's also interesting, the personalities. Um, we've only seen a couple of the characters so far, but I really like how they've set up the, um, the different personalities being not quite what you'd expect in this kind of a show. Um, so those archetypes are mixed up somewhat in this show, which is kind of interesting. Um, I'm also curious, there are a few images thrown in there that uh, just seem a little um, out of place, and I'm just curious where they're going with that. But uh, overall, this is kind of a feel-good anime, about enjoying anime in general, and enjoying friendships and things along those lines. So, okay, we'll see where it goes, but it feels like a, a feel-good show. Alright, um, Black Clover. So, this is one of the Shonen series uh, of this season. Uh, where are my Black Clover notes? Because um, that was kind of an interesting one. Um, definitely had some thoughts. There we go. So, very dark um, start to the show. Um, unfortunately, it does this thing where the main character is a jerk. And it feels like a very Naruto setup, where the main character is this a-hole teenager who's also been bullied, so the bully, bullying is kind of what makes him a jerk. And you're supposed to want to follow him along on his journey of kind of redemption, right? Um, and the problem I had is that he's a bit too much of a jerk. You know, I, I, there wasn't a lot of redeeming qualities to him for much of the episode until the end of the episode. It, ha it does that thing where if two characters disagree and one starts yelling... That's automatically funny. No. But some people seem to like that. So it's one of those, eh, I, not, a, not a huge fan of it, but well, you know, what can you do? Um, very high budget animation. Again, it's the first episode. But a lot of time and effort put into this world where basically everyone can, can cast magic. 
And so there's lots of interesting you know, visuals of people using magic in everyday life. That's really cool. Um, there are some fun sort of side jokes in it. Um, there's obviously a bit of humor thrown in there. But again, a very Naruto-style show. Curious to see where it goes. Um, what I did like was the ending of the episode, and again, no spoilers here, does add a twist I didn't expect. Uh, and does um, does some things with some of the characters that kind of that help with that premise and help me to appreciate the characters and where they were going. Um, if you like shonen, this is definitely a show to to check out. But if you find shonen cliches a little old hat, um, you probably will find this you know just very much in that shonen archetype. Again, not a bad thing. Just this is this is very much a shonen thing. Um, but again, beautiful, beautiful animation, and some really neat world building in there as well. Some, some neat visuals around how this world works. Uh, moving on to Blend S. So it is a very cute show um, with some interesting elements around the concept and the characters. Um, it feels very much like a four coma manga. So this is one of those things where there is a... Um, um, it's basically you know, just little jokes, little things being thrown into the characters um, and, and their situation and what's going on. Um, fun show um, about this girl who goes to, uh, who can't find a job because she has this naturally um, severe look to her. Um, but she is, you know, her personality is very sweet. So she ends up getting a job at a, a, uh, basically a character cafe, so kind of like a maid cafe, but where each waitress or waiter has a specific character archetype. Um, so instead of just being like Haruhi, you're just a tsundere or a loli or whatever. Uh, and so one of the fun things about the, 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 the concept is that the personality of the waitress does not necessarily match the personality that she, she shows off at the restaurant. So seeing the, you know, the differences between that is, is fun. Um, it's also interesting that the main character is very interested in traveling internationally. You know, Japanese high schooler who wants to do that. And then she interacts with this uh, foreigner who uh, works at the restaurant, um, who is, well, is a foreigner, so she's interested in, in, in that aspect of him. Um, and he finds her very cute. Uh, so I, I liked that dynamic. I thought it was a, a neat way of adding kind of a twist to those personalities. Um, it's unclear whether that's going to be like, a real romance or whether it's just like, oh, that's a thing that interests me, oh, it's a thing that interests uh, me, who knows. But again, interesting twist. Uh, very cute uh, ending, thing, uh, ending theme, and there's a post-credits moment, which I, I thought was really funny. So, that's a fun one. Again, light romantic comedy, not really romantic comedy, comedy with cute characters. Eh, can't complain, can't complain. Uh, again, also on Crunchyroll. Mostly things are on Crunchyroll. Uh, moving on to DS Irai. So this is a darker show. Um, again, let me get my, my notes here. Kind of all over the place. Okay, there we go. Um, big fantasy show. Uh, some very interesting visuals. Um, this is an odd one because it's all this first episode is all about Nazis. And I don't mean, like, people walking around wearing Nazi-style uniforms. Um, I'm talking about, you know, the main characters are all Nazis in World War II. That's a little hard to swallow as protagonists. Now, they're not necessarily good people. Um, but they're definitely our viewpoint characters. Um, that I should say there's also some fantasy elements going on. So it's not, you know... Um, it's clear that it's not just going to be Nazis in 19... I think 38 is when this episode is, is, is set. It's clear other, there's other fantasy stuff going on. Um, as I recall, in the opening of the ending theme, you see... Whoops, sorry. Um, my little timer. In the opening or ending theme, I, I think you see modern characters, modern-day characters. So there's something else going on there. Um, but it's very much about... Um, so it focuses on this one main character who has this huge, big, extremely powerful supernatural ability. Um, and I don't think it's a spoiler to say, like, we don't know what that is yet, uh, exactly. Um, so there's clearly some kind of supernatural hunting thing going on, that whole occult Nazi thing. But you're definitely, definitely just following Nazis for an episode. Uh, so again, I, I had that, um, that difficulty with. 
Uh, there's also just there's a lot of characters. It's a very shonen sort of concept in that it's a lot of characters with powers fighting, right? Uh, more of an action show, a seinen esque action show. It, it might have it might be one of those things that actually shows up in a seinen magazine, but it's more aimed at teenage boys, right? Uh, there's also some very dark uh, imagery in it, some some strong violence in it, um, and it's interesting. I'm not sure where they're going with it. Um, again, I don't think the show is sympathetic to these characters, um, but it is also... I don't think it's sympathetic to Nazis, but I think it is showing the, you know these characters in this situation. So I'm, I'm curious where it's going, but it's definitely different, um, definitely remarkable, uh, definitely unusual, and there's definitely a lot more going on to this story than what you see in the first episode. So again, sort of that weird supernatural fantasy stuff and a, a quite high animation budget for something like this. Several animation mistakes in there, um, so that's not necessarily a great sign. They may be putting, biting off more than they can chew, but definitely an unusual one this season. One of those, okay, you went there. Um, speaking of unusual, Garo the Vanishing Line. So this is actually part of a larger sort of franchise, several... We based on several manga that have had several different like manga and live action adaptations. Um, you old school fans um, who have seen Iria Zerum the animation, uh, the guy who designed Zerum um, uh, is the author of this basically. And uh, but this is more of a supernatural action show. Think kind of like Trigon in the sense of being a um, an alternately um, light and dark action story. Um, it is set in a, a modern city, although it's not a defined, it's not Chicago or New York. Uh, it's definitely an American city. There are diners and things along those lines around. It definitely feels more like, it's basically New York. But, um, you know, it, it kind of alternates uh, between di uh, different tones. Uh, there are these beasts, kind of monsters around. Um, some weird shaky cam stuff during the action sequences. Uh, which sometimes is there to kind of cover up bad animation, but from what I can see, the action animation like it is quality. Like they've got clearly got some high-powered animators working on on the animators uh, the animation here. Um, also interesting, a Korean director. Cool. So yeah, also interesting. Um, there is a um, this CGI uh, version of the online world which looks almost exactly like Oz from Summer Wars, and it turns out they got the guy who designed the characters from Oz and Summer Wars to design these characters for this CGI kind of world. This sort of, you know, uh, VR Facebook, if you will. Um, so, yeah, basically two characters. Um, you've got this big, beefy guy who is your kind of supernatural warrior main character, sort of your Vash, um, and he's kind of a you know, carefree biker dude. And then a you know, young teen girl that he gets involved with, um, and uh, it's clearly going to be sort of about you know the two of them, and you know he helps her and whatever. So there's a lot of adolescent power fantasy to this. It's definitely, you know, it's definitely very metal in that sense. Uh, you know, the guy feels like a 15 year old's you know power fantasy, but that's fun too. Um, quite the impressive animation budget again. Um, some really neat action moments. And um, a pretty big set of voice actors in this. Pretty, um, you know, uh, well-known voice actors in this, at least on the Japanese side. Um, pretty, pretty, pretty cool. So um, I liked it. I liked the character designs. I liked the action. I liked the character. I liked the, um, the personalities of the characters. It's big and bold and brassy, and that's just fun to see in anime, and uh, you know, just a, a fun thing. All right, uh, moving on to Girls' Last Tour. Our first anime in here on this, on anime strike. This is an odd one. Uh, girls' Last Tour is about two girls um, who appear to be teenagers who are wandering through a a battlefield, a vast battlefield. Like the entire world is a battlefield, and no one else is left alive. It's just them. Uh, I'm not saying that's what happened, but like they're the only characters you ever see in this episode. And it is them kind of wandering around in this world, exploring it, and, you know, looking for food and such. It's... <clears throat> so the weird thing is, both of the girls are moe blobs. 
And by that I mean, like, their heads are these ovals with these, you know, very simple mouths, or simple eyes and little lines for mouths. Uh, their bodies are not complete, yeah, they're, they're fairly uh, simple. Um, but they're in this very somber world that's done with great care and detail. And there are some somber moments in this episode. So it's quite dark, despite the fact that the, the two girls basically act like they're in a... They have the personalities of characters in a school life comedy. So it's just kind of them chatting and trying to do things, and one of them's a little less responsible, one of them's very responsible, so it's kind of that, you know, um, personality conflict going on. So it's this weird juxtaposition of moe elements with this hardcore somber war element, which I really liked. I found it a fascinating juxtaposition, beautifully rendered. Um, again, a lot of attention paid to doing this. One interesting thing is that for part of it, they're on this... Um, it's, it's not a tank, but it has like tank treads, sort of a, um, a personnel character, a carrier kind of a thing, like you see it over there in the image. Um, and that is all rendered in CGI, um, including the characters. But then when you know, they move off of that, they are hand-drawn. They did an amazing job of making the CGI characters on the, the, the personnel carrier look exactly like the hand-drawn char characters. Like, it, it's seamless. Very impressive work. Um, and just a very interesting tonal thing on there. Not what I would have expected, and uh, a really, um, really interesting show. Speaking of interesting show, Just Because, also on Anime Strike, which seems to be killing it this season. Um, there were four shows on Anime Strike that I, I checked out this season. There weren't any, anywhere else, and I found all of them interesting in different ways. So Just Because is a... I'm still not sure what this show is. It appears to be a school life kind of a drama. There's some comedic moments, some romantic moments. It's kind of... It's a lot like His and Her Circumstances, actually. Uh, where, you know, there's comedy, there's drama, stuff like that. But this is more on the drama side. It's about a variety of, of characters at a high school, um, basically. And it, it, I believe the first episode takes place in real time, more or less. There's one flashback, but the rest of it is basically these different characters all interacting, or, you know, one goes off and she's, and she's over there, and you cut back to her occasionally, and you see just what they're doing um, at the end of this one school day. And it's just really thoughtfully presented. The animation style is also unusual. They go for a little rougher animation style in the sense that it's more dynamic. You know, when characters move, there's a little bit more energy to it. It's not quite that, you know, carefully crafted and controlled animation that can be a little stiff in, say, um, you know, a lot of romantic comedy shows. Um, this feels a little bit more like... A Memorial Hosoda film, for example, where the, yeah, the animation can be a little bit more loose. A really interesting show, and um, I really like how they set up these characters. None of the characters feel like anime archetypes. Um, they are all different characters, but it feels like we're going to get a sense of th these feel like real people. You know, these feel like real teenagers, as opposed to either the kind of one-dimensional archetypes or just the you know we need this in this show element for that. I'm just very impressed with this show overall, and it's very different. I'll put it this way. Halfway through the show, I was like, I think this is a baseball anime. And it might be! I still don't know. It's, it's a very, very interesting, you know, visual take on things, and uh, just an interesting show. So, um, also interesting direct, directorial style. There's a lot of intercutting between different characters, um, and a lot of, like, you'll see two characters interacting, and then you'll cut back to one character watching them and cut back to the, to the first one. No dialogue, nothing else, just that character knows what that character is doing. So it's really interesting stuff there. Um, definitely my kind of a thing. Um, it feels like one of those things where <clears throat> there's a lot going on in these characters' heads that they're not going to just immediately tell you. Right? It's not just going to be right there in the dialogue. So that's cool. Uh, moving on to Juni Tyson on Crunchyroll, so I think this is going to get a lot of interesting um, attention from people. It's a um, 
it's basically a dark action series uh, where these various characters are coming, are coming together in sort of a battle royale, uh, a battle royale fight to the death situation. They're all extremely skilled fighters, though. Uh, so you think, you know, very bloody action, R-rated action film kind of a concept with a lot of characters fighting each other and, and you know, who will survive. Um, what's remarkable is that the characters all appear to are well, they are all clearly um, based on versions of the creatures of the Zodiac. So, for example, one of them is the ram, and who literally has ram horns uh, coming out of the head. Um, and so they all like look visually not unlike an animal, which is kind of off-putting and strange. I like the the intensity of the show. Um, there's some very dark moments in the show, and especially they, they reveal um, some some elements of one of the characters' personality and like, how she got to, who, uh, you know, uh, how she became who she is, and there's some really dark stuff in there. Um, so that's that's interesting. The problem I have, um, and, and the animation, oh my gosh, they are pouring money into the animation budget for this show. There's just so much going on. Um, this feels like if you like action anime, this is where to go. That said, the the personalities and the styles of the characters are very over the top, um, to an, to an at least Naruto level degree. And I'm not complaining about Naruto there. I'm just saying you know, they have some pretty over the top you know characters and personalities. In Naruto, you get that there with these strange character designs, um, and just the juxtaposition of that can feel really off putting sometimes. Um, it just doesn't feel like it meshes very well unless you can just kind of go with the flow of that. So um, I think a lot of you who are just kind of familiar with anime, you can you can let that slide. But you're probably going to have a difficult time, you know, getting other people to watch this show. Unless it's like, oh, that's goofy, that's weird. Um, but definitely high quality animation, very dark, you know, trying to be more, uh, more like a movie. You know, more like an R-rated movie than a lot of other anime out there. So nice to see something unusual like that. All uh, right, um, The King's Game, another show that I think is going to get a lot of attention. Um, basically, a teenage boy is uh, uh, targeted. Um, he and his classmates all have to play this thing called The King's Game, where they get text messages telling them things that they have to do. Uh, so they are directed to do certain, uh, certain unpleasant things. Uh, and if they don't, they are, they are killed um, by the end of the day. Uh, and so it's this, again, sort of battle royale who will survive. Um... The animation budget is um, certainly enough. Um, I wasn't like really shocked by a lot of the animation budget of this, but again, it's the first episode of a horror anime, so often they hold off on you know really creepy or or, or high budget animation things until later on in a show like that. Um, but it's basically here are all these characters, and we're going to see what happens to them. I have a problem with this show because a the main character is very bland, um, and b it's essentially a supernatural thing, um, and, well, it's a spoiler to explain why this is a problem, but um, I found it to be a very artificial concept that would be relatively easy for the characters to work around, um, to find ways to essentially resolve within the peer group, uh, and to kind of just make their way through, it, it just... I have a hard time believing that this would be as horrific or dramatic as it would be because of a very easy way of just, again, kind of getting around it. So, it, eh, artificial concept. That's probably just me. A lot of people seem to be interested in this show. Um, and it is definitely a straight up, you know, big horror, horror show. Um, give it a try. See how you feel. Um, just certainly not my kind of thing. Um... And uh, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Um, very angsty, to be honest. Um, but I just thought it was kind of, a, kind of a silly idea. And one we've seen a lot of. All right. Um, but now I get to talk about Kino's Journey, The Beautiful World. So I watched the original Kino's Journey anime when it was released over here in America. And um, it quickly became one of my favorite anime of that year. Um, a show that I just adore. I've turned other people on to it. 
Um, it's a really interesting concept, really interesting thing. It's based on a series of novels about a um, young character named Kino on this motorcycle. And Kino travels from country to country. Kino does not live in, in the normal world. Um, in Kino's world, basically, um, there are a bunch of different, like, essentially, city-states everywhere. So Kino gets to go from, like, one little city, experience that culture, and then go on to another, another uh, uh, place. And Kino only spends three days in any given country. So usually every episode is one or two countries being explored, and it turns into sort of a Twilight Zone concept, where Kino gets to experience this way of doing things. Um, I should say the, the animation quality is certainly up to snuff. This kind of a concept, again, does not need a huge animation budget, but it needs enough to get across different things in different places. You're going to have some action sequences, and because Kino lives in this because it is a potentially very dangerous world where you're traveling from country to country and some places are more hostile than others. Uh, like Kino needs to be able to draw a gun and fire it quickly. So you're going to have those action sequences. There's a, certainly enough animation to render those very well. Uh, and there's certainly some moments where they, they did more than they needed to for Kino's journey. The first episode deals with a very hot topic in society right now very hot topic, um, and goes in a direction I did not think they would go. I was quite impressed with their take on this particular thing, um, and kind of sticking to their, to their guns on that, if you will. Um, pardon the pun. Anyway, um, some lovely lighting in the show, lovely visuals. Um, they redesigned some of the characters, so it does not look exactly like the show from, gosh, it's 10, 15 years ago now. Um, but I, I, I like the visuals, and they've done a good job of updating the, the styles. Just making a different, you know, different visual style to this. It's a little brighter. Uh, the old Kino's journey is uh, a little bit more pastels. This is a more, uh, you know, bright, normal, if you will, uh, anime style, but still more subdued than typical anime. Thing. This is a thinking person's anime series. This presents moral questions and philosophical thoughts in a show, which I've always, I'm always interested in, and it does it. What I really like is it does that, it presents it to you, and then it just moves on from there. Like you can just take that as you will. What's also interesting is at the end there was this like radio drama moment where it was just the characters talking over, over um, you know, an image of a, I think a fire that had, had burned out. Um, so not quite sure where they're going with that, kind of interesting. And it appears, I'm not sure, but it appears to be dialogue, the end of a conversation that started at the beginning of the show. So I'm not sure if they're going to kind of bookend each episode with that. I'm, I'm curious. But uh, yeah, Kino's Journey, definitely doing a good job with that franchise and that concept. Uh, moving on to Konohana Kitan. This is a very, very, very cute show. My gosh. This is a cute show. Um, if you've seen Hanasako Iroha, the show about a teenage girl going to work at a uh, traditional Japanese inn, that is exactly this. But basically everyone is kind of like a yokai. There are... Um, cat people and dog people and um, various creatures and you know kitsune and and, and um, um, what do you call it um, other creatures uh, in sort of humanoid form and some in non-humanoid form uh, all, tanuki that's what I'm thinking of um, all in this world there are no humans there's all sort of humanoid um, um, animal creatures if you will not necessarily yokai but some of them might be yokai-ish and basically this girl of indeterminate age, she looks to be maybe 12 or so, who is uh, sent off to work at this thing. Um, there's some very interesting work here with personalities and characters. Um, it's clearly, it's a cute show about cute characters doing cute things. Um, there's very little in the way of drama. There's some s somewhat serious moments, but it's clearly meant to be a relaxing, fun show about, you know, cute characters. Uh, that said, I'm really impressed with the fact that uh, the main character, Sakura, moves... Uh, there's a little girl named Sakura, sorry. The main character, um, this, this girl, walks around and moves like a kid, right? And this little, this little like, girl, Sakura, who's maybe about five or so, five or six, she, the, the way she moves and walks around reminds me of a kid that age. So they're really thinking through that. There's not that 
sadly typical thing where everyone kind of moves the same way, right? And people just kind of talk and, 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 and of course they're all wearing basically yukata, um, or kimono rather. Um, so they do a really good job of thinking through character animation, which I really appreciate. Um, and it's very much, a, a, at least the first episode, is very much about appreciating the moment, enjoying where you are and enjoying uh, you know, your life. Um, so very cute. The characters are thus far completely one-dimensional. Um, we may go in, you know, further into this, but it's definitely one of those you know, cute shows, cute things. That's just what you're going to get. Fair enough. All right. Uh, Land of the Lustrous. Oh, boy. Um, another show on Anime Strike. This is a show about um, a bunch of girls who are all based on precious stones. So sapphires, rubies, things like that. Who are all protecting themselves from what appear to be invading Buddhist gods. Because the problem is, if they're attacked and they are hit by a physical attack, these girls shatter. <clears throat> they have this amazing, they all have this uh, somewhat clear hair that is not hair. It is a, a hair-shaped gem. So Sapphire has this red hair, this, this red but slightly transparent hair. Um, it reminds me a bit of Revolutionary Girl Utna in the sense that A, the characters all have these kind of elongated bodies, it has this odd, somewhat abstract visual style, the environments are kind of over-designed, uh, very odd visuals, massively tall ceilings in places, stuff like that. Um, this is not your typical sort of situation and environment. Um, it's a remarkably visually constructed show, and pretty much every shot is not this. It's not, you know, a camera on a face that's looking at you. It is a, it is a different camera angle, and it's 100% CGI. Um, I don't think I've ever seen CGI modeling of anime characters that looks this perfectly like anime characters. You all know me. I love hand-drawn anime. I love the look. I love the visuals. But they have so precisely captured the facial expressions, the movements of those characters in this. They've even gone um, lower frame rate um, at some times on the CGI to make it look more like hand-drawn animation. It's amazingly well done in terms of making it feel like anime. I very rarely say this, but if all anime moves towards this style of CGI, I would be pretty much okay with that. This, oh my gosh, did an amazing job. And it's different. Um, it's lighthearted a lot of the times. The main character is this kind of fun, um, uh, somewhat uh, clumsy girl who's given this particular job. And you follow her along that. And then there are these serious moments. There are some really... Some dark territory covered in this first episode. Just very impressed. This is very interesting, very unusual. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm in. I'm all in on this show. I want to see more. I want to see where this is going. Um, just really, really unusual thing. Again, anime strike. Not get out of the ballpark this season. Uh, all right, moving on to a fun show, Love is Like a Cocktail on Crunchyroll. This is a, I think, three to five minute episode uh, anime series. Uh, it is about a woman who works at, um, I should forget what her job is, but basically she is, um, she has this corporate job, very responsible. When she comes home and she has a drink, she really lets her hair down and she relaxes and unfortunately, that's a personality that she just does not want to get across to her workmates, to her peers. So she can only kind of do this in front of her husband. By the way, this is a show about a married woman and her husband. That's pretty awesome. Um, how often do you see that in anime? So it's kind of this laid-back show about husband and wife kind of hanging out after work. And, you know, when she uh, gets some alcohol in her, she's, she's not crazy, but she's just much more relaxed and, and laid-back. So it's, a, it's just a kind of a fun show to see how their personalities uh, work with that. You know, nothing hugely complicated, but it's fun um, and a pretty decent animation budget for this kind of a show. So I'm, I'm hoping they keep that up. 
Um, fun show. Really enjoyed it. Uh, but again, you know, brief. Um, nothing wrong with that. I think that episode, that, that length works pretty well for that concept, too. All right, moving on to um, another show that's gotten uh, some significant note. The Recovery of an MMO Junkie. This is about a young woman who has left her job um, and has decided to become a neat for a while, um, i.e. somebody who has no job and isn't really planning to get a job. She just wants to not do anything for a while. And she gets deep into an MMO. Uh, in the MMO, she plays a guy. <clears throat> and she starts hanging out with a girl in the show. Very cute girl. Very cutesy girl. You know, classically cutesy girl. And they start... Um, they start developing a relationship. And I don't mean a romantic relationship necessarily. Um, although it develops in kind of that, that, that direction. Um, but it's more just... They really like hanging out together. So it's going to be very... I'm kind of curious to see where that goes. Uh, what I really like about the show is that A... The MMO feels like an MMO. Real life feels like a real life. But also there's not a big deal made about the fact that she is neat. The, the, the fact that she is, you know, not working and just playing this game. That is just who she is. Um, in other words, she's not presented as horribly pathetic. Which is really nice in this genre. That she's just, you know, says, you know, I'm just going to spend how many months just chilling out at home all day. Um, I mean, it's shown to be not the, necessarily the best use of your life, um, but that's just a thing she's doing, right? And you come to appreciate her personality and wh where she's doing this, where she's just like, I want to check out a reality for a while and just have fun. So I like that, yes. I mean, it's clear where this is going, um, uh, Evie in the chat room. Um, uh, you know, it, it's pretty clear, you know, who, you know the girl's going to end up being, you know, a, a guy. Um, but... Again, I, I think they, they do a good job of setting up this relationship and having it develop over the course of the episode um, and establish these personalities quite well. Um, I, I think for the concept, this is what I would want out of that concept, right? Um, the animation's there, all that kind of stuff. Um, has a surprisingly somber start, um, but uh, it just kind of you know, moves on from there. And there's some fun stuff around... Um, MMO um, concepts and kind of classic MMO things where, like, this just happens. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, so it's, it's pretty cute. Um, there's some fun little jokes in there. Some Watamode feels to the show, if you will. She's certainly not as um, as pathetic as the main character of Watamode, but, uh, there's, you know, a little bit of a, of a hint of that in the show. <coughs> really love that. All right. Uh, let's talk a bit about Sengoku Nightblood, which is an Otome anime. Pretty sure. <laughs> Pretty darn sure. Modern Japanese teen girl ends up in the days of the unification of Japan around, you know, Hideyoshi and um, Oda Nobunaga and all those guys. Um, except half of them have cat ears and half of them are vampires. Yeah. Um, it's definitely an Otome game. <laughs> it's definitely, a, you know, a concept that is aimed at girls where they're surrounded by hot guys, um, often who have, you know, cute aspects to their characters. And the main girl is basically ends up, um, running around with, uh, Hideyoshi. Uh, and here's the thing, um... It is a... The tropes are there, but there's also plot. Like, they introduce you to these various characters, they introduce you to where things are going, and it turns out this is not just historical Japan with cat ears. Um, there is other stuff going on, again, no spoilers, but you know, there is other stuff going on. This is a, a different world that is mimicking things in our world. So the, the, the plot's not going to necessarily go in the same direction. Uh, and I, I really liked that idea. They also reverse a trope, an important trope, near the end of the episode. I don't know if it's going to go there, but I was really interested to see them deliberately say, no, we could actually 
completely upend this, which is, which is really remarkable. Um, I also like the personalities of the characters, where Hideyoshi is this very charming, cute guy, um, but also, like, he needs her around. Like, there is something significant to their relationship that you don't often see in these concepts, where, or in these, these, these sorts of shows, where he sees something in her, and he's not just going to give up on that. Like, there's something going on there. And, and it's not just, oh, you are the chosen one. Um, I mean, she's clearly the chosen one. But it's, it's, it's not purely out of... Um, it's not because she is special. And it's not because she's the protagonist. Like, he sees something in her personality that he wants to explore more of, it seems. So I really i am I'm intrigued by that. Um, and again, it's, it's this odd combination of anachronisms. Um, uh, the characters are often wearing, like, modern clothing, despite it being that, that era. Um, so it, there's some cute stuff, um, there's some dramatic stuff, and it's weird, but again, I, I think it works well for its premise. So no complaints, um, and if you're into that kind of thing, I think this is a well-constructed version of it. Um, similarly, Taisho Mabius line, Mabius line. Um, I think, as you can tell, this is pretty clearly another Otome thing. These are only a few minutes long, each episode, though. So this first episode was just introducing us to the main character. Um, very quietly and slowly paced for a three-and-a-half-minute episode. Uh, and then there's some cute SD stuff with the characters in the, in the end credit sequence. Um, but it appears to be that just this quiet thing about a character during the Taisho era of Japan. So I'm intrigued to see where it goes, because it seems to be more of a historical story. Uh, about this era of Japan expanding and modernizing um, um, and opening up to, to the rest of the world. So I'm, that's a curious one. I think at three and a half minutes, it's the kind of thing that you can just kind of jump into, check it out, and see where the, uh, where the story goes without you know, getting too wrapped up in, in the, you know, the particular style of it. I think it'll, it'll jump around. Um, you know, it'll, it'll give you material pretty quickly. Uh, all right, two car. So, Two Car is about cute girls riding motorcycles. I could stop right there. Um, it is very well animated version of that, in the sense that there's a lot of attention paid to making sure all these girls are cute, uh, and the character designs are pretty consistent throughout the episode, uh, and they drive... Any Mystery Science Theater fans will recognize that they all side hack. So, uh, basically, they, um, there's a driver and a passenger. The driver's on a motorcycle, and the passenger's on a, on a, a sidecar. And as they go around curves, the passenger in the sidecar leans to add traction and to kind of move the whole machine, you know, more or left or right or whatever to, you know, various, to various degrees to, you know, increase the torque and such. And what's interesting about it is it is clearly, you know, it is people who, like, cute teenage girls, they're all in high school, um, and, you know, motorcycle racing, right? You know, that kind of mecha thing, where you know, it's not giant robots, but it's, it's mechanical stuff racing. It is really cool um, in that sense. There appears to be, from this first episode, more or less nothing else happening. Um, there's personality stuff between the different characters, and they're clearly going to explore, you know, why different characters are the way they are, but it is just that um, given to you at a high animation quality. This is the 10th anniversary anime series for this studio, and it feels like they basically said, look, we want to draw cute girls, and we want to draw racing. Put them together, and we're going to make that show. Um, so, again, I, I would not be into this for the plot. I would not get into this for anything else than this is a very well-rendered show along those lines. I, I thought it was really, again... I think once you grab that, and if you're okay with this, this is going to be a really fun show to just kick back and relax with. There is a little bit of fan service in the sense that these girls will be, you know, going around a corner and sticking their butts out, and the camera happens to be, like, right on their butt, right? Um, but it's it only happened a couple times in the episode, and it's not like, oh, I'm taking off my outfit, you know? It, it, it's not... It's not overt in that way. It's more like 90s style fan service, right? Where there's occasional camera angles, things like that, um, but it's not quite as overt as we often get it these days. So 
Um, you know, I was impressed with the quality of it overall. Uh, almost done. Moving on to UQ Holder. This is a bit of a surprise. Um, this is an anime, also an anime strike. Um, it is a sequel to Nagima. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Nagima franchise, at 80 years after the plot of Nagima, um, there are a couple of characters that um, follow over from the original Nagima uh, that you will see um, show up, and you'll see why. Uh, if you know Nagima, you'll understand why that could, that could happen. Um, but there are also some, some callbacks, and in, indeed, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that the, the beginning of the episode is set during the era of Nagima. Um, and so you see a bunch of the characters from Nagima, and then it kind of transitions to these new characters. Very much a shonen show. Um, quite a, a high-budget shonen series, at least in episode one. Um, and, you know, the main character is this completely by-the-numbers shonen protagonist. And I'm not complaining about that, it's just... That's who you get, right? You, you, you know who this is. Um, so I'm watching this show, and I'm... I got it. I see where they're going with this. Um, there's a surprisingly affecting moment near the beginning of the episode with one of the characters where I'm like, oh, that's somber. Like, that's a really interesting, dark little moment. And then about three quarters of the way into the show, something happened where I... <clears throat> I... rose up out of my chair. Like, I was surprised at what happened three quarters of the way through this show. Um, it's dark and it's bloody. Um, and then they kind of go on from there. But, like, this gets to some, some, some nasty, some nasty work. Um, and I say that in, in all respect. I mean, th they get real with this show all of a sudden. Especially in this shonen concept. So, shonen series are often about, um, unprepared youngsters getting involved in very dangerous situations. And this shows how that can go very, very poorly. To just give you that, that, that idea. Um... And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm just saying it goes poorly. So I was impressed with that. Um, again, some very bloody moments. So don't have little kids around when this is happening, when you're watching this. And I'm impressed that they went that way in this pretty standard shonen series. Pre pretty standard shonen concept. Um, and there's some, some nice elements around some standard anime concepts around family and things along those lines. And, and you know, learning how to be yourself, etc. So, I think it's interesting. I think it is um, definitely trying to do its own thing within the shonen formula. It's also interesting because Nagima is a school comedy, pretty much. There's action and there's, I mean, there's other stuff going on in Nagima. But, um, you know, its premise is uh, Harry Potter with lots of cute girls, right? Um, um, and a, a guy who can blow their clothes off when he sneezes. Mmm. Kanakamatsu. But... This is much more of a shonen show, so it's interesting to see where they're going to go with that kind of concept. Um, yeah, there, it, it's a certain amount of shock factor, and, and certainly it is meant to shock you, but it is also clearly there to demonstrate an important element of this world and this universe. Um, so I think it, it is well placed, despite being, yeah, just kind of like, okay, well, you know, wow. So again, anime strike, good on you for, for, for doing this one. Uh, finally, uh, let's talk about Urahara. Oh, man, Urahara. Do not show Urahara to a non-anime fan. Urahara is about three girls who have a clothing store in Shinjuku. And half the episode is about them talking about how much fun it is to make clothes and wear clothes and all that kind of stuff. One of them has a heart-shaped computer tablet, like iPad. Um, it's extraordinarily stylized. Very odd visual, you know, um, um, conglomeration of, of visual ideas and, and stuff going on. I mean, the show pretty much looks like this. Um, and then aliens show up and start... Um, taking different aspects of world culture because they have no culture of their own. So the main characters all have to transform into these very cutesy things to fight them off. 
Um, but it's not a magical girl show. Like, they're not magical girls in that sense. Like, one of them has this, you know, this awesome sort of street battle outfit. Um, it's very shoujo with fighting aliens with cuteness. When you defeat the aliens, they turn into chocolate-covered donuts. Yeah, that's the kind of show you have. I was thoroughly entertained for the entire time because it is a classic goofy anime concept, right? It's going to be just, you know, here we're just throwing fun weird stuff at you. It'll be just a delight to sit back and watch and see what they come up with. A little like Panty and Stocking, um, without all, all the weird perversion of Panty and Stocking, right? Um, and without, you know, there doesn't need to be too much, I mean, there's some parody aspects in it too. Um, but it's one of those, you know, here's just, here's something different, um, that you're just kind of have, going to have fun with. So kind of slice of life with magical girl-esque action sequences, it's weird and different and really, really fun. Yeah, Twin Tail character is, is cool. I actually liked all three of the, uh, the, the main three, uh, characters, all of course teenage girls. Um... Definitely very clearly aimed at, like, preteen girls um, who want to be into, like, clothes and crafting and things like that when they grow up. Um, but just this, this wild visual show. Um, one of those things where, like, I'd like to watch more of this just to see where they go with it. So, who knows? All right, that is it for everything I've seen of this season. I know there are a few more that came out again that I didn't get a chance to watch. Um... But that is what I was able to check out. I hope this is helpful. I hope you um, check out some of these shows and find something you really like. Uh, definitely some interesting anime in this. And until next time, I hope you watch more interesting anime.